many of you won't watch this video till the end, but if you do, there's a lot of good information in it. I personally partake in social media, which comes in many different forms, from Facebook to YouTube, and by doing so, has formed a friendship with some and allowed me to engage with an audience, usually through comments. There are many top-rated farm YouTube pages. Uh, many of those share good quality videos, but very rarely talk about the truth of agriculture. Although such videos as Cole the Corn Star uh, have dived into how much farmers make as a take-home income. I've spoke about farm income subjects on my second channel, but thought we'd do more of a deep dive on the main channel here. Explain from a farmer's perspective, and again, I am just a simple farmer, but this is what I've learned over time. And while it's likely that this video will never change anybody, it might open a few people's eyes as to what's really going on. And I've covered this with statistics and data uh, that's easily obtainable online. And if you're a farmer, you're probably wondering what's the future right now, as well as our, myself trying to do long-term projections on what things we'd like to do to our farm going forward. And it's always hard to predict the markets, and if you knew the markets, you'd be a multimillionaire. But nobody has that crystal ball. So what I do is just rely on internet sources or data and try to compile my own information. There is talk that in the year 2025, commodities could go back to $5 corn. I went to an inflation calculator, as you saw there on your screen, and plugged in the year 2025 as a prediction as to what they thought inflation will be, and as to what it would have been is in corn prices in 2017 and you can see that five dollars equals about three dollars and eighty cents previously during the trump administration he applied tariffs which really cut our commodity prices and many farmers won't talk about it but they are starting to loosen up their lips a little bit now uh, when they talk to our farmers in coffee shop groups or maybe a little bit on social media but nobody really wants the truth to get out there so a lot of people remain tight-lipped even though they're their house suffering in silence what a lot of people were complaining about was the prices we got during that time era were not prices that were sustainable for a long-term range of agriculture, including some people talking about selling personal items to stay afloat. So at that time when corn was selling for four, it really needed to be five, and you have to remember that most of our inputs were much, much less than now. So $5 corn really by the modern day standards or in the future really isn't going to cut it. A few videos back, I talked about commodity prices throughout the years of history. I also talked about farmer hypocrisy. Just going back into the standard inflation calculator here, though, going back to 2012, weighing $7 corn as to what it would be now, over $9. So by no means have we hit anywhere near $9. So they talk about these new record highs. Well, as far as on the, on the scale of 1 to 10, yes, but as far as what that has buying power, we've by no means uh, reached the top end or have highest um, net incomes and in fact uh, checking net income amounts actually the wealth gap separation the amount of net income that we make has actually been in a decline for many years and again most of that information was covered in the uh, videos I did prior I continued to play around with the inflation calculator online plugging in previous received grain prices and how that uh, would stack up against current dollar amounts. You can pause your screen or just hit the play button and see where these numbers or scenarios all line up. And yes, we are making more money, but the money that we're making has equal buying power. We're just handling more of that money. And in fact, we're actually handling more of it to buy less with it than previously before. So as far as what we have to spend or what it will buy or quantity of how much we're buying is less and this is inflation some things have inflated disproportionately such as a tractor and what you're seeing here on the screen now is the same inflation calculator 2007 versus 2022 a brand new 8330 John Deere which anybody familiar with that model would be basically what we have now in an 8R280 it's the same tractor just a modern day version and for that fact, most of the things or options that come on that tractor are nearly the same. That tractor was a cage price on the lot of 2007, and we know for a fact, as we bought tractors at that time, about $135,000, which equates out now to about $194,000. The kicker is that 8R280 cage, well, now this is when we bought it pre-COVID, 
was about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now we didn't buy that tractor; we lease it, and the lease is, is high twenties uh, per year. Sadly, that eighty-three thirty with mid-range hours or half-life on the tractor is going to have a retail price currently of about $160,000 or more than it costs brand new. So if you were to go buy one used, instead of leasing that brand new tractor, plug it into a current equipment calculator, you're probably going to give up five-year terms and you're going to pay about 8 to 9% interest depending on what bank you go to. That's going to give you an annual payment of about $45,000 a year, so even more than the lease of the brand new AR280. Now the takeaways from what I just said are the tractors more than doubled in the last 10 to 15 years. However, the technology and the basic functions of that tractor have not, and in many ways they're almost identical machines. And I showed you what the commodity prices were versus where they are right now. So you tell me whether what we buy with our money and what we get is moving forward or backward. Why did that tractor double in price? I don't know. Go ask the companies that build them. And you might also ask about the union strikes and the CEO paychecks while you're there. As I'm sure that that had a large part to do with it. Our commodities sure did double. And as I just showed, they didn't even really keep up with the cost of inflation from what they once, they once were. According to statistical data, bankruptcy has actually stopped or declined from what it once was uh, during those Trump era um, tariffs. It was really skyrocketing. Uh, then when COVID came in, tariffs on top of it, $2.80 corn, much below cost of production. Uh, things were crumbling pretty quick. And I've had a, a couple people that work in banking that have told me is to just keep money on the good years and then you'll have, you know, you can bankroll yourself through the bad years. Well, not many businesses have that mentality that they know or they're facing that they're going to have to somehow supplement themselves through bad years. I mean, at all times, any good business should just make money. If you have an ice cream shop, well, I'm not going to be customers next week, so I better keep all the gross profits we made this week. So I can cash flow it. Because somehow that makes logical sense. And we'll come back to this topic in a few minutes because it's totally wrong and you really can't keep money at all. I'm on the Farm Credit uh, website. This is free. This is just a uh, mortgage calculator here. And you can see you know, your first box, your principal, interest rate. And you can plug these in, it'll spit it out. And it shows you here interest and what you're going to pay total. So I just threw in some numbers, and obviously interest is much higher right now. I've heard it rumblings of 9%. I don't know. I think it kind of depends on who you are, uh, which variable interest, depending on who you are, in my opinion, is a lot of crap. But anyway, uh, I'm just plugging in some random numbers. But what I wanted to show you on this was right here, and this is the view, your amortization. This is going to show you uh, how your mortgage is going to be structured, and you got your year one, so your payment stays the same, but it shows the amount of interest you pay and the amount of principal that comes off your loan. So this means basically what the bank's getting back, and this is means actually as to, so if you borrow 20 bucks and it's gonna cost you $100 to borrow that $20, uh, the first year the bank's getting uh, uh, 19 or $20 back and uh, you're getting a uh, dollar of your actual $20 paid for. It's about that bad. And that's a that's a poor uh, analogy for what I'm trying to describe. But what I really wanted to show you here in this amortization schedule was uh, tax code. And so let's go out to about year 10. This is a 30 year you plugged in. So you're going to start to see this increase, and you're going to see your loan coming down. So we plugged in a two and a half million dollar loan, and you can see as you get on farther how it goes to hardly any interest but how this pertains to tax code is this is tax deductible this is after income earned money and not tax deductible so to get up paying tax you need to have interest write-offs 
so they get their money back first then it starts to flip-flop to where the actual loan gets paid back which is basically credit then yeah your balance starts to come down a little bit but that's also probably where you're gonna start paying tax because you no longer have as much of this to deduct and this really all goes back to the end of the gold standard in 1971 if you have a big giant pile of gold which gold is a commodity removed from the earth you base your amount of money or the amount of money that you have off of that pile so if, if corn was the commodity that money is traded off of you'd have a big pile of corn the amount of corn that's there is the value of what the corn's worth is the amount of money but they took that away and they went to a country of basically credit and money is created when you have debt so like a credit card a credit card doesn't have any money how you get money on a credit card is you use the credit card which the idea is you'll pay it back so it's it's a country of credit now if you're smart and you don't want to pay any taxes you go in here and you figure this and you say well, I'm gonna deduct all this and whatever I make cash flow off of that ground will pay the payment and you know I can write the tax interest off and I get out of paying tax but then as you approach at year 10 the banks all healed up and they've got a lot of their interests um, that's a good time to actually refinance debt now most ag banks want to stay about 50 percent debt to asset ratio which means if you own a, a, a chunk of ground you borrow about half of it so if you had a, a farm that's worth a million dollars you can borrow 500,000 against it so if you stay in that category of half debt, half ownership, you can usually stay with an interest rate that, uh, or an interest amount that's tax deductible. It'll keep you keep you out of the, the tax collector. I, I see farmers all the time. They go, well, I don't really want debt, so they, they want to stay debt free. But if you stay with that 50-50 ratio of debt and uh, you know what you own, equity, now, why does a bank want you to stay 50-50? Well, that's because of your fixed costs and then your mortgage, which is what you borrowed with against your 50% equity. If you figure your mortgage and your fixed costs, and by fixed costs, what well, means your diesel fuel to run your equipment, your seed, your chemicals, your fertilizer, everything else. Basically, that is the definition of cash flow. Um, you are going to say you have a million dollars of total gross annual um, sales but you have a million dollars of total gross annual bills but the ability to pay those bills and and maybe that was a poor analogy maybe it's 999,000 so your profit margin was actually one dollar left over for yourself to do something extra with but it doesn't really matter so if you have a million dollars in sales and a million dollars in bills you had cash flow to cover uh, these two things, your mortgage and your fixed costs, and that's where that 50-50 ratio comes in. Now, a lot of businesses would be uh, closer to the 100% debt ratio, and I've covered this in my other videos. So if I bought a, a bulldozer, you know, I could go out and borrow the whole the whole dozer. Uh, you're not paying fit. You can pay money down, but you don't have to to make it work. On a farm, you pretty much have to to make it work. Uh, that cash flow usually covers about 50% of your debt, which is not a great business. Uh, where a dozer, you may eat rice and beans, but you can cover the payment of the whole amount of the thing. Uh, in my opinion, commodities or something should be good enough, or prices should be good enough to cover 100% under cash flow. But it's not. So if you're established and you can borrow half on your farm, you want to stay 50-50, your costs and your mortgage, um, that's going to cash flow to cover your bills and as I just showed you won't have to pay any tax because you can write off your interest and you can grow exponentially so say you have eight million dollars equity you borrow four uh, against it that's you go out buy a big track of ground that starts getting paid off pretty soon you're year 10 you say okay I'm gonna start paying tax I'm gonna go borrow against it again because my principal's pulled down a little bit go buy another 200 acres and stay even higher so yeah you're in continuous debt but yes you are growing exponentially and yes the cage flow is there now I find it very coincidental that the tax code is written within 
again, debt is, is money. That's how debt is the generation of money. So if you're debt free, uh, at the end of the year, you're going to owe tax, uh, income tax, because you don't have things to write off, such as that interest. Uh, you would have, probably have some things to write off, but you're not going to be able to write off that that interest, so you're going to owe tax. And uh, if you owe tax, what guys do, well, I don't want to pay the tax, I'm going to go out and I'm buy a tractor. So if you got 200000 in your bank account, you're not going to just keep 200000 in your bank account. So these guys always talk about, well, I'm debt-free, I don't have to worry about anything. You're really debt free, but the bank, the, the government's not going to structure it so that you can keep that 200 grand in your bank account. You're going to have your bank account stripped out, where you do it this way through the amortization, as I was showing you, and grow exponentially, or this way and pay the tax to them, so that they can reallocate your money for you. Or you can get out of this by going out and making purchases, whether it's cash, or it's putting it on a loan and buying it and deducting that interest, whatever you are going to keep that money flowing. What this plan does is it keeps the banks in business, keeps the banks making a shit ton of money, it keeps new money being generated at all times, fractional lending, every other scumbag thing. So when we talk about nationwide debt, usually they're just talking about the government. It's not really concerning the private sector. And the idea that this supposable credit will ever get paid back no, it probably won't because, as I just said, you go out, you're 10, you refinance, you refinance, you refinance, you refinance. You're never going to get rid of that debt. You're just going to give them what they want, make their big juicy cut, which just makes the banks a huge amount of money, and it keeps you from paying tax. And that's what you can do to grow exponentially. That's what people do, utilize debt to, to uh, buy assets, and it's all part of cash flow. Do I personally think it should be structured that way? No, I do not. I do not like a being a country of credit uh, versus a country of actual real money. Now, for those that think that we're just on the edge of our currency collapse and it's all out the door, uh, yeah, our currency is devalued, but is it going to collapse? Probably not because of the agreements that they signed, which was like the Brent Woods agreement that they signed that basically means our dollar is based off the value of gold even though it's just on a currency and that ties to our dollar is worth the intrinsic value that other countries follow. So in other words, if we collapse and our currency is worth nothing, the other countries go broke with us. This is basically what keeps our dollar worth anything. But what I wanted you guys to take away there is a farmer can utilize debt to generate money to grow exponentially when the bottom line is all you're going to do is show cash flow only. And yes, if you are technically debt free and you're just wanting to just buy something at the end of the year to avoid the tax man, um, yes, that is also a way, but oftentimes finding the item you want or whatever is sometimes a little different story. And it does work, and you can get out of paying tax then. But the bottom line is, again, that the major takeaway is you're not just going to keep cash to your to your checking account. Uh, you're not just going to hoard cash. And uh, this is clearly all by design. It's by design to make banks money. It's by design to keep people from hoarding cash. It also totally eliminates competition of a young guy wanting to get started in it because the only hope he'd have is something like a young farmer program. So after learning all this, I can see why a younger guy never has any hope. And I kind of find it sick and disturbing that the American Dreams now led to this uh, using tax code to basically keep certain people of power and a certain stature afloat. And it uh, also keeps dollars in circulation. But new lending, which is generation of new money, all, all is derived from this. Now, it's in my opinion, a lot of farmers like to be the debt-free route. Then just make year-end purchases to get out of the tax man versus actually, like, just paying loans uh, continuously and then, or, or lease tractors or whatever like we do uh, to avoid paying the tax man. At the end of the day, you're just kind of slicing the same apple uh, different ways. But the biggest fear, uh, if you are making the payments, is what are you going to get for your commodities and what level of price do you have to have or what's your break-even and ROI? And... With things such as fertilizer going through the roof, it's hard to answer that question. It's even more difficult to answer that question when there's many factors that are beyond your control, such as this year, which was a, a nationwide drought, but at the same time, a nationwide drought led to a shortage, which a low supply leads to higher prices, which, I mean, pretty much all markets or commodity markets are going to be controlled by supply and demand. Yeah. 
So breaking that down, yeah, you may have a better price for your product, but you don't have as much product to sell. And if you have a lower price for your product, you may have more product to sell. Additionally, when prices go up, a lot of times inputs go up. And that's just because these corporations have monopolized markets uh, and they're able to take advantage of things. But there's also such factors as fertilizer and energy and other stuff that do have other factors to them, such as even the war in, in, the, in Russia right now or the Ukraine or whatever going on. Uh, which leads to, to some of those prices uh, increasing. So, and ever since COVID and everything's uh, happened, it seems like things have been a pretty rocky roller coaster. Uh, a lot of people were saying well, it was the China Phase 1 deal uh, that led to our higher prices, which if you really read into it, what they bought was by no means uh, fulfilled their obligations. And I firmly believe it helped, but do not believe it was the sole contributor, uh, considering we had 23 million acres of prevent plant as well as derecho the following year. Uh, at 20 some million acres of uh, destruction is what really led to a large amount of uh, um, higher prices and I talked about that again in the uh, the other videos I posted you see articles like this where you know farmers flourish under Biden see recovered Trump or trade wars uh, not really uh, again there's politics in play there that are have absolutely nothing to do with anything because uh, the politicians and their mere being seated in their position does not have anything to do with the drought leading to a shortage. But then again, sometimes uh, things politically do have big impacts, uh, and that would include things like from Jimmy Carter with the, with the food wars, and even uh, the Trump tariffs, um, they hurt pretty bad, and that was followed right up by COVID right near the same time. And we were labeled essential, so we kept planning, but they said that there was literally no use for our product, uh, which led to prices to be at all-time lows. They came out with like CFAP payments and stuff as part of their stimulus packages. And uh, those those CFAP payments were somewhat inflationary, but at the same time, they the government basically said to farmers, you eat half the loss, even though the shutdown was our own doing. And you got to remember that a lot of these bankruptcies and stuff where the farmers are already facing these crises was taking place prior to COVID, so the COVID was just a, a nail in the coffin for some operations. Uh, not good times through agriculture. And like most things the government does, if you're an essential worker, you're going to get screwed. Uh, you can go online here to file for an operating note, which will allow you to possibly better your farm by selling commodities when you want. You basically, it's like borrowing money that you can use. It's like having a credit card. So if you're not going to get your paycheck that week, you can just put your gasoline on your credit card and pay your credit card off next week. That's kind of the same idea. And it tells you how you can go through the website here, and it gives you the form you can download. That is getting a kick out of this. Uh, <laughs> goes through and asks, applicant is, and you can pause your screen, but a refugee or other and your race and your application if you choose your race, then it goes down here to ask if you're Hispanic or not, or if you're a veteran or not. And these are scoring systems, social sc uh, scoring systems. And it has absolutely not one freaking thing to do with if you're going to pay your loan back or not. Part of that easy credit system. I had a guy I was talking to, he used to work at McDonald's, now he works at a John Deere uh, dealership. He was talking about how people that get $15 an hour, maybe you shouldn't get $15 an hour because what their job is not worthy. And I made the argument that it doesn't matter what you get paid, what does it buy? Uh, he didn't get it whatsoever, but let me break it down. If somebody worked very hard for you, but you paid them in toilet paper, they wouldn't like it much because toilet paper is not going to be able to go down to Walmart and buy them a new pair of shoes. If you pay somebody $10,000 an hour, but a pair of shoes is $350,000, then that $10,000 an hour seems like a lot of money, but it's not. So it's not what are you getting per hour, it's a lot of what does it buy. Most people don't really get this, so they see it one way. So let me break it down a little bit more. Say you have a factory, and this is in the United States, and you have the factory generating money, which pays the workers, uh, with the goods they sell. So the workers grow and grow and grow and they get more and more and more money. Now the more and more money that they have to sell, they go out and buy more goods, which is generate from factories, which in then turn have more stuff to sell and usually raise their prices, especially if they monopolize or whatever. 
and then that goes full circle and it just grows and grows and grows now what we've done here in this country is we've run all of our factories out of this country to China and we pay the China worker next to nothing they get a little tiny amount of money the reason they did that was to get out of liability lawsuits uh, pollution laws all sorts of things like that and it allowed the workers to be paid very little so now that the Americans don't have money from this, they've found ways of making money other ways. And when things are not being produced, you rely on the old printer to spit out some dollars here. So we've been printing all this extra money, running our own circle of money here in the United States. And we take that circle of spending money and we buy stuff from China, a lot of stuff. For a very small amount, and the reason we buy it for very small amounts, again, because everything over here is very small amounts of money to make, uh, including what the workers get. So it led to basically a deflation by, we were able to spend a lot of this, printed money, but not increase a lot of these, our money, because we were able to buy it for very low amounts here. Let's recap the video at this point. Debt can be good. Foreign labor, because it's cheap, is deflationary. The end of the gold standard equaled a system of credit. Farmers ride highs and lows in the markets, but when they ride these highs and lows, that goes back to utilizing debt to stay out of the tax man or purchases. And that also contributes to deflationary times. And the reason that highs and lows in these markets are all pretty much because of the end of the gold standard. And the bottom line is, money is devalued because of inflation. Inflation means there's more money supply, but it also means that money supply is, has less value. You just handle more money to have equal buying power. What used to cost a dollar now costs five, but the five buys what one used to. Now these are the key takeaways of this video. And these are the things that are somewhat influenced uh, by politics and somewhat not. But these are what make a farm tick and how a farm can be prosperous or crash and burn. Now being a farmer myself, and like all farmers, we want the uh, highest price commodities we can get. We want $10 corn, $20 beans, and we want super cheap inputs. But that's usually not what you get. And as a farmer myself, uh, I do complain about the input prices that skyrocketed, such as certain things going up 200%. And you really got to ride these waves and fluctuation very carefully. But the long term of it, which is why I started talking about the tractors at the beginning of this video, is generally speaking, we're in an economic decline. Meaning that what we make per acre versus what our costs are, replacement equipment costs, uh, those things are going up quicker than what our commodities are. So if this line here, the squiggly line, was commodity prices going high and low and you draw a strike point average to them, it is in an increase. But you look at like equipment costs, seed costs, and everything else, pretty much everything, especially equipment, is in a, a climb like this. So you can see that gap is basically what's going to contribute to your net income is getting less and less. And that's basically leading to a decline. So yes, I'm handling more money, but at the same time what I'm getting to keep is less and less over time and again this can all be backed up through things as you just saw there on your screen which would be like the Iowa uh, recordings there of all the cash grain prices throughout history and you can plug those into the inflation calculators uh, that I started out the video with and why this happens is because of what I just got done explaining in the recap of this entire video what I've learned through the social media is a lot of people are very short-minded and narrow-minded meaning they don't read much they don't study or understand markets in a whole and they only know or see what they have learned in their lifetime and they fail to realize that generally speaking history repeats itself even though it may not have been in their life then they spin it towards politics and so oh, it's the republicans did this or that oh it's the democrats spent this or that when the truth was if you look statistically throughout the years especially after we ended the gold standard, this has been in an agriculture, I should say, has been in an economic decline, as well as many other people's livings, for a very, very long time. This has been coming uh, even prior to the gold standard ending, 
and especially after. Low to no productivity, printing yourself into a hole. Basically, we blew bubbles that are eventually going to burst. Most people don't even remotely get this, and they won't even understand this video or even have sat through it. And again, I'm just a mere farmer, but what I have learned is enough to utilize certain avenues of money, certain generations of money, such as figuring out the creation of money has allowed our farm to prosper. Uh, and you have to, again, understand cash flow and projections. And it's a lot of stress on my shoulders, but I'm sometimes able to do what others are not. But again, that comes back to you and what your personal comfort level is. Because a lot of times to define your destiny, you have to define yourself. And I've said that exact same thing in prior videos, but never went into a video uh, explaining it or how or why. And another thing I've noticed throughout social media is a lot of people, uh, especially in person during these bad economic times, they're very reluctant to talk about it. And I wouldn't put certain things out here on social media myself just because there's people out there that want to harm you and that all comes back to the one thing that they need a never-ending uh, supply of more of, and that's money. And they'll utilize those things to uh, obtain more of that money for themselves. So therefore I only make the videos slightly uh, generic. Or as generic as possible as to how it pertains to the subject we're talking about. So do what you want in your own operation. I could care less. Go make your own video that's ten times better than this one. But if you're somebody who understands the money in this country and you're also utilizing the way that money is generated, then there's a good chance you'll understand this video. Now, if you're a real fan of this uh, channel at all uh, and you really want to stick around, I'm going to try to continue multiple videos in the future. I really wanted to get some really good filming. I, I really almost need like a camera person. I'm trying to tuck my wife into it, but I'm really trying to, to bring the channel up. But the biggest thing I lack is timing, but I really want to utilize the platform to share my experiences with it. And share even more videos like this one, except maybe better quality editing. And explain maybe how to grow an operation. But, again, it's me. So anybody that gets something out of the video is great. And if you don't, uh, that's fine too. Nobody has a gun to your head uh, forcing you to watch. So, get out of it what you want. Uh, enjoy the content. If it's something, again, that's mentally stimulated you and you agree to it. Uh, leave it in the comments below. I'm always happy to hear from you. And again, I've made good friends off of social media. So that's where I'm going to leave this one. And um, hope maybe a few of you uh, learned something out of it. And if I can bring all the editing together, which is what I was really wanting to do with this channel, uh, that's a big if because it's, again, timing. Uh, I think we could really take this channel in a really good direction. Definitely no other farm channels talking about the subjects that I'm talking about. I recognize that and even been told that. So hopefully, again, we utilize the platform to continue that and take it in a really positive way, uh, even agronomy-wise, and uh, I'll continue to share my life experiences with you guys. So appreciate it, and if you want to wait on this subject or know how you can grow your business or what you've learned, share below. See you later.